Parev, Yasas, Marhaba. I want to give a shout out to Dari Ephraim for his ministry in in shedding light on social issues and systemic racism in our country. I am making a video today that is going to talk about segregation in schools. But before I begin my, presenta my presentation and my research, I'm gonna go to my quarantined classroom um, that I set up during this time in the pandemic. So hold on, I'm just gonna go. Whoa, okay, I'm already here, I guess. Wow, wait, Minion, how'd I get here? Ooh, I dragged you over. You're a piece of paper. Yeah, but I did it. Okay, well, so what am I doing? Quarantine classroom? No, you're talking about segregation. Oh, right, okay, sorry everybody. So yeah, I'm gonna be talking about segregation today. Oh, I made a presentation. Doug, are you ready? Oh, okay, man. Okay, hit it. You got it, dude. Is school segregation really a thing of the past? Many have seen these photos in their history textbooks. The phrase separate but equal during the Plessy versus Ferguson era was disingenuous because black schools were in much worse conditions with little to no resources than white schools. Shout out to Getty Images. So eventually, the Supreme Court deemed segregation as unconstitutional in 1954's Brown versus Board of Education. Sounds like progress, right? Well, let's look at some of the challenges and resistance to integration. In 1957, Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas made an effort to integrate. Let's watch some of the footage of what this was like. The campus of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas became a battleground in the fight for school desegregation. It was in September that nine black students, six girls and three boys, became forever known as the Little Rock Nine. I remember when I was in high school, I read a memoir called Warriors Don't Cry by Melba Patillo Beals. She was one of the nine students, and in her book, she recounted her experience that included the great adversity she faced at Central High School during this time of desegregation. Now, let's fast forward to 1963 to Governor George Wallace's inaugural address in Alabama. Let's listen to a divisive statement he made in his speech. Let's see if you catch it. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation Hey, what a guy, what a guy. Anyway, so Governor George Wallace's divisive statement became a rallying cry for those opposed to integration in the civil rights movement. About a decade later, school districts were forced to desegregate by federal courts and schools became increasingly more integrated due to cross-district busing programs that transported a mix of students from different communities and neighborhoods to the same schools. In 1968, about 75% of black students were in segregated schools. Fast forward to 1988, the rate of segregated black students drops to 25%. Lots of historical studies have shown that this change had an incredibly positive impact in terms of achievement for black students with no negative impact on white students. But not everyone was in favor of integration. In fact, a new generation of conservative judges didn't like the idea that the federal court was uh, making decisions and forcing schools to integrate. So a lot of districts, a lot of school districts in the North and South began to drop their busing programs, which many community members were already not in favor of for years. Ooh. Yeah, I know. And we can see today that segregation has worsened in the United States of America. The most recent data shows the average white student goes to a school that's more than 70% white. A study ordered by Congress found the percentage of high poverty schools with mostly black or Hispanic students has more than doubled since 2000. 2000. But why are schools still so segregated? <laughs> well, according to Richard Rothstein, the author of The Color of Law, Excuse me, sorry. Neighborhoods across the USA are still mainly segregated. Since public schools are in neighborhoods, schools have remained largely segregated. It's 2020. Why are neighborhoods still segregated? Many communities are still self-segregated. Some local activists see this as a natural change. It's not a racial thing, we argue. It's about parents from diverse backgrounds wanting the best for their kids. And that means going to a neighborhood school that they don't have to take a long bus ride to get to, and where they'll be with other kids from their community. So supposedly parents and activists are saying that segregation is a choice. They are saying that they don't want the government to force their children to take the bus from one side of the city to the other just for the sake of diversity. But I think that that paints a false narrative. And yeah, that's a load of mm, chill. Because I, I think about the disparity of wealth between families. I think of how one neighborhood that's wealthy, they have schools that are well funded because those income taxes are what funds the schools that have. And so those schools have more resources, teachers have better pay versus a poverty stricken neighborhood. Those schools are underfunded and not as many resources. So therefore not as many opportunities for those students. And I can't help but think, do parents really have a choice? Would they really prefer for their children to go to schools that are underfunded and don't provide for them as many opportunities? Well, one of the causes for why we have racially segregated neighborhoods is redlining. And redlining happened in the 1930s, and 
We see cases of it in Levittown in 1947. And then we had the 1968 Fair Housing Act and 1977 Community Reinvestment Act to dismantle redlining, to put it to an end. But even as recent as 2018, there was a lawsuit against Liberty Bank in Connecticut because there were some redlining incidents. But what is redlining? I'm going to show a quick video explaining how redlining contributes to the systemic racism that plagues our country today. Decades after the Civil War, many government agencies started to draw maps dividing cities into sections that were either desirable or undesirable for investment. This practice was called redlining and it usually blocked off entire black neighborhoods from access to private and public investment. Banks and insurance companies used these maps for decades to deny black people loans and other services based purely on race. Historically speaking, owning a home and getting a college education is the easiest way for an American family to build wealth. But when Jamal's grandparents wanted to buy a house, the banks refused because they lived in a neighborhood that was redlined. So Jamal's grandparents were not able to buy a home, and because colleges could prevent them from attending through legal segregation, their options for higher education were really scarce. Jamal's grandparents, on the other hand, got a low-interest loan to buy their first house and got accepted into a handful of top universities, which traditionally only accepted white students. This opened up a wealth of opportunities that they were able to pass on to their kids and grandkids. And white flight was another cause for segregation. Ooh, white flight? Is that a bird? Not quite. Yo, Doug, cue the visual. What the? Oh my gosh, not again. Alright. Sorry. <coughs> oh. Oh. oh, my bad. White flight is when white middle class communities move from urban areas to the suburbs. Let's look at the connection between redlining and white Station flight. to the Atlanta real estate market showed that banks were more willing to lend to low-income white families than to middle or upper-income African-American families. As a result, today, for every $100 of wealth held by a white family, black families have $5.04. The results of white flight are a significant decrease in the number of schools that had mixed populations that included white or black and Latino students. This map shows the percentages of black students in majority white schools as of 2012. The five states that I chose to focus on are California, Texas, Georgia, Maryland, and New York because they're the most segregated schools. These two pie charts show the demographic makeups of two schools that are in my city. Yo, oh my gosh, I'm getting hungry because I said pie. Okay, no, but seriously, this pie chart over here, the inner city school, it's about 90% of minorities. That was the school that I used to work at and comparing that to the suburban school that's located in the same city, they have um, a very different demographic makeup of the school that I worked at. And we can see here that segregated schools have a negative impact on black, Latino, and low-income students. The thing is, segregated schools do make it more difficult for students of color to be able to graduate high school and to um, go to college and get a high paying job. Let's take a look at how implicit bias perpetuates these inequities. Implicit bias. These are prejudices in society that people are not aware that they have. Let's go back to Kevin and Jamal. Against all odds, Jamal manages to be the only student from his high school to get accepted into a great university. The same one that Kevin and his high school friends are attending. But after Kevin and Jamal both graduate, Jamal notices that his resume isn't drawing as much interest as Kevin's, even though they graduated from the same program with the exact same GPA. Unfortunately for Jamal, studies show that resumes with white-sounding names get twice as many callbacks as identical resumes with black-sounding names. Implicit bias is one of the reasons why the black unemployment rate is twice the rate of white unemployment, even among college graduates today. But on the flip side, there are some success stories out there of students who have risen above all of that adversity, and those are incredible feats that cannot be ignored. For sure. And I'm glad that colleges have affirmative action so that there's a more equal playing field for these students that are coming from these poverty-stricken communities. For an administration that provided um, an equitable education for our students, and uh, that means that the lessons that we needed to make, they needed to be targeting each individual student needs and to not assume that every student learns the same way. And so I, I really appreciated working for an administration that really pushed for that. And I believe that equity in education is super important because I think that it allows for each individual student to flourish in their learning and to become well-rounded and equipped agents of change in this world. And, you know, I, I know that we still have a long ways to go. I showed you those demographic charts earlier of two schools in my city, the city that I was just praising. We still have a ways to go. But one of the ways that I can remain active in this is I can continue to read, continue to research, continue to engage in conversations, and and continue to attend peaceful protests about, about these things. And so I just want to uh, leave you guys off with one of my favorite verses. 